Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Sixty-three of the team house. I haven't even started drinking yet. Uh, I'm Jack Murphy here with Dave Park. Dee's producing. Uh, we're really excited tonight to have our guest on the show, Kim Casey Campbell. She is a retired uh, A-10 Warthog pilot. Uh, flew numerous operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, had the distinction of almost getting shot out of the sky and making an emergency landing. And she is today does public speaking engagements. Uh, she has a book coming out in March and a number of other things that I'm sure we're going to get into in this interview. Uh, so, Kim, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And we are drinking the Oban tonight. What, what do you have there? Uh, I've got a I've got myself a, a gin and tonic. Nice. Awesome. I love gin. I love gin. So let's jump into, you know, the classic uh, question about your origin story. I'd like to hear a little bit about your upbringing, uh, where you came from, and how you ended up uh, in the military and becoming a pilot, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, I think for me, everything goes back to fifth grade, a uh, long time ago. <laughs> and uh, that was 1986, so I'll date myself. But uh in 1986, um, I was watching the Challenger accident, uh, the Challenger launch that then turned into a, you know, a pretty uh, horrific accident. And there was something about that that just, I don't know, it just resonated with me in terms of the pilots, the astronauts died doing something that they believed in, something that was more important than themselves. And it was just this immediate connection to realizing that there were things out there that were just bigger and more important than me. And uh, I also really like this idea of flight and uh, just the freedom that goes with it. And uh, I started talking to my parents really about how to be an astronaut. And uh, my dad, who had spent some time in the Air Force, told me that most of the astronauts had been pilots first and many of them had gone to the Air Force Academy. And so right there, fifth grade, I decided that uh -huh. I was going to the Air Force Academy. I was going to be a fighter pilot. And uh, initially, my intent was to go on to be an astronaut. So I decided that in fifth grade. That was 1986. And uh, women weren't actually allowed to fly fighters at that time. I had no idea. And uh, my parents never told me that. They just kind of <laughs> said, all right, if that's what you want to do, then go after it. So That's awesome. Uh, interesting start. I mean, I, I don't know why that I still to this day, I mean, it's obviously been a long time, but I, I don't know why that challenger accident just connected so much with me in, in that way. I, th I think it's fascinating how the, uh, how sometimes these like horrible events or horrible things are the incidents, the events that spark this idea in the minds of young people that drive them towards governmental service. Uh, it just yeah. like reminds me of like, like um, we we're talking about with Amy Forsyth, the movie Full, Full Metal Jacket inspired God knows how many people to join the Marine Corps. It's a horrific movie. Like Stanley it's Kubrick, yeah. Stanley Kubrick directed that film to like scare people away from war. <laughs> I think, and but instead it inspired so many people. Um, and it's just interesting that yeah, you saw you know this horrible accident, all these astronauts you know go blowing up um, during a launch, and that was what made you think, yeah, I want to do that. That's <laughs> That's where I, I know. Go. It's like the opposite, right? Yeah, what yeah. Should have happened. Um, yeah, I, I just, you know, I remember watching and just my mom was sitting next to me and she's, you know, I was just devastated by it. Like yeah. it just, it was like I knew the astronauts personally, which I didn't, but for some reason it just really <laughs> hit me of um, realizing that they died doing something that they believed in. Yeah, you connect, you connected with their mission and with a sacrifice. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think and their purpose. Mm -hmm. And and on that, I mean, on that particular launch, I think civilians were more attached to the crew because uh, uh, Krista, Krista McAuliffe, McAuliffe, the right? In space. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so, how did you, from the age of five until you were in high school, how 
did you just have that in your mind or how, did you prepare for it? Did you say, you know, these are the things I want to get good at or uh, like, how did you prepare yourself? Yeah, I would say that that totally flipped a switch for me. I don't know that I was totally committed to school or really anything else right. prior to that. And when I told my parents that I was going to the Air Force Academy, they were like, well, uh, <laughs> it's it's time it, you need to uh, get your shit together, yeah. for lack of better words. I mean, they didn't tell me that in fifth grade, but that's essentially what they were saying. Like, hey, you you have to be ready for this. This isn't just an easy thing that you can say you want to do. You need to put in the effort. And um, I think that decision really changed my path because I became totally committed to school. Uh, I was already involved with sports and things like that, but I realized just kind of that being well-rounded, committing to sports, committing to extracurricular activities, volunteering, being involved, all of those things um, would help me uh, go to the academy. So it just really kicked me into gear in terms of having a path and a goal that I was that I wanted to go after, right? Like that was the difference. Nobody can tell you like, you got to work really hard to go to the academy. You have to want it for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I was totally committed. And so by high school, you're putting in your application for the Air Force Academy. Yes, I. that was the only place I wanted to go. I did not apply to any other service academy. It was, it was the Air Force was for me, the only uh, school that I wanted to go to. My parents made me apply to other schools uh, as probably good parents do just in case. Uh, so I had applied to a few other schools and, uh, but I put everything towards going to the academy. Um, it was a good thing my parents made me apply to other schools because I actually got a rejection letter from the academy uh, in the spring of my senior year, uh, oh, really? which was totally devastating, right? Like this is everything that I had worked for. And uh, essentially the academy said, um, thanks for applying, but you're not competitive enough and uh, which sucked. I mean, it was terrible. Um, I had, uh, I wasn't very good at my SAT scores. So all the other stuff that I did, you know, was great, but uh, my SAT scores weren't so good. I eventually took the ACT and was able to get a competitive score, but I did not get an acceptance letter to go to the Academy until about three weeks before basic training started. So, Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So, so how did that work if you got that in your senior year? So then you had to like take the ACT and reapply real, like quickly or. You know, I got that rejection letter and uh, that was all I'd ever wanted. I mean, I, I had other, you know, I had some other school applications in, but my liaison officer, who is the person that works with all the uh, candidates uh, before they go to the academy, he said, look, if you're if you are totally committed to this, then don't quit and write the academy a letter every week. And so I did. I wrote the academy every week. I wrote the registrar's office and I said, hey, I'm still interested. If somebody else turns down their spot, I, I'm here and available. And I would like send them a letter and say, I could do five more push-ups." And I sent them letters, you know, updating my scores and updating. We actually had to update my ACT scores in the system, but every week I wrote them a letter. Um, it got to the point where, you know, as time went on, I figured my letter writing campaign wasn't actually going to work. And so my next plan was to just show up uh, on in-processing day in hopes that like somebody would be afraid to get off the bus and wouldn't go. And I would be like, hey, I'm still here. You right, know? right. Uh, I'm ready. Uh, thankfully that didn't happen. Um, but yeah, they just updating them. And I don't know, I think eventually probably someone turned down a spot and they eventually got to wherever I was at on the list and got the, uh, the appointment. But I'd like to think that all those letters worked. No, I, I, I mean, I can't imagine they didn't. Like that's really showing dedication. You would have thought Selma Hayek would have thought that when I was sending her letters, but I got a restraining <laughs> order instead. Um, no, but I'm sure that they helped, you know, like, did you ever get to talk to anybody in admissions about that? Uh, so, yes, I, after uh, after basic training during some point in the early part of my freshman year, I got back from class one day and there was this letter sitting on my um, desk and it said, uh, please report to Harmon Hall, which is our like the administrative building where the three star general is that like no cadet ever wants to go to. Uh, and it was signed from the admissions office. And so I you know, found my way up there and they actually they were like, we had to meet you. You wrote us all these letters. We had to meet you. Uh, and uh, they very nicely, they said that they took every letter uh, 
they put like a little smiley face on it and put it on the uh, main, the the admissions office, like the prime officer on his desk. That's fantastic. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so hopefully amazing. it works. So your, your letter, letter writing campaign uh, was effective. You got into the Air Force Academy. Tell us what the academy was like and, and sort of what that pipeline is like. That you, you Do you go to the academy first and then flight school? Um, do yeah. you have to get selected for aviation? Walk. I'm just an Army guy. I don't know any of this. So if you could walk us through a little bit of that, it would be cool. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so four years at the Academy, about our uh, probably junior year time frame, we put in our dream sheet of where what we want to do um, after we graduate. And, uh, you know, the Academy is a tough place. It's uh, I wouldn't really say that it's like fun to go through. It's one of those things like looking back, I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, I, I love the opportunities that it presented. Um, all the challenges, I think, made me better in the long run, but it's a pretty tough place to be. It's not your traditional four-year college uh, at all. Um, but I met incredible people there, um, learned a lot about myself as, you know, kind of going through all those hard things. Um, but every, you know, your, your, how you perform at the academy has a direct correlation to getting the job you want. And so you are, you know, one to a thousand uh, in your class ranked and they'll start at the top and whatever the number one cadet wants, then they start working their ways way down. So there's only so many pilot slots available um, and, and not everybody's pilot qualified medically, but it's really based on your performance. You know, how well you do at the academy, you put in your dream sheet and you hopefully get what you want. Uh, and so I was able to get a pilot slot out of there. Um, and then uh, after graduation from the academy, I, I ended up spending two years in London, uh, going to school, getting my master's degrees. Um, and so I took a quick little break. Uh, it was just a great opportunity I couldn't turn down sure. uh, to go live in the UK for a couple of years. And then I went to pilot training after that. And uh, what was it like? I mean, flight school, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it starts off somewhat generic, right? They just put you on a trainer. And then from there, people branch out into their specialties. And but what year was this? Was were we still in the period where women were not allowed to fly fighters? So um, women were allowed to fly fighters starting in 1993, which is when I graduated from high okay. school. So that kind of that transition got made. Um, and uh, so by the time I got to pilot training, there were women that had had flown fighters, uh, not very many, but there were at least a few that had come before me. Um, so you get to pilot training, you start out in a, a trainer, uh, used to be when I was there, a T-37, it's now the T-6, it's a generic trainer. And again, it's, it's based on performance, how well you do. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you'll track to either, if you want to go fly helicopters, you want to fly heavies, cargo aircraft, or you want to fly fighters. Uh, and I knew from, I mean, the get go, like my plan was to go fighters, uh, and then like the first three weeks of pilot training, uh, all I did was puke on every ride. It was horrible. <laughs> it's like, great, here's this plan that I have, my goal in life to be a fighter pilot, and I'm just puking uh, from air sickness. It was, it was pretty dang miserable, uh, but eventually I just pushed through it, got through it, my body adapted, and, uh, and I, I did well enough. Uh, even despite all of that, uh, did well enough to choose the fighter track. And and then once you chose the fighter track, how, how did that start out? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you, you choose the fighter track and they send, there were eight of us that went fighters and we went to the T-38 was the airplane that we flew. Um, it uh, can go supersonic. It's uh, it's kind of a an early stage jet fighter, if you will, uh, trainer. But now you're around a bunch of fighter pilots who are teaching you how to fly. You're doing a little bit more formation type stuff. You're doing some low level missions. For me, it was like, OK, I found my home. This is this is where I'm meant to be. Um, I realized pretty quickly that the, the air to air work, like the formation was eh, it was OK. But I loved the low levels. Um, you know, to me, that was like a really fun mission to do. So that started you know, at that point, we're all kind of talking about what fighters we want, what are available. You could get a fighter or a bomber out of that and uh, really started talking to other pilots about what airplanes they had flown. 
Um, and uh, the A10 kept coming up to me as something that I thought would be um, pretty cool to fly, but also just the mission of close air support and supporting troops on the ground. It just seemed like something that uh, met every criteria for me of, you know, a, a, a purpose, something that I believed in, um, and also just a, a fun airplane to fly. Were people around you, like your teachers and other pilots you knew, were they supportive of that? Were they dismissive of, of the A-10 as it's, you know, it's not a, a real fast mover? How, how was the attitude? You know, it's interesting. I think um, you find the people that have flown the A-10 and they are so passionate about it. I mean, I don't know that I really cared what all the other instructors right. thought, right? Like the A-10, I don't think was ever going to be like, if you graduated number one in your class, I'm not sure the back then uh, that the A-10 was where people, that's not what people were selecting. You know, they were selecting the, you know, the sleek, sexy F-15 air to air, you know, think Top Gun, right? This is right. pre-9-11. So right. uh, this is, you know, we're talking, you know, potential for an air war and becoming an ace. It's all very, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's something that a lot of people are interested in, which is fine. We need those people too. Uh, it just wasn't for me. And um, I realized that this idea of, of close air support was really what I was after. Um, so uh, I graduated high enough that I could get the airplane that I wanted. Uh, and uh, it was pretty exciting. Uh, my, so the other part of the story is that my husband uh, was flying A-10s at the time as well. So I knew about the A-10 community but I wasn't really sure that I wanted to go fly the same airplane as him. Right. right. Like there's gotta be a little separation between church and state. Right, uh, right. But we were, we were trying to figure out how we could actually stay together. And uh, we just, there weren't many options that were going to be good if we wanted to try to keep our assignments aligned. Um, so that was part of the other factor in trying to narrow it down. But uh, I knew what the A-10 community was about from him. I had met a lot of his friends and, uh, just a great group of guys. I mean, absolutely, just totally belief in the mission, despite the fact that this was all pre 9 right. 11. We you know, there wasn't a huge mission for us. Right. At the time. Yeah, it was not a. I mean, now everybody knows the A 10. It's a sexy bird that, that you know, it, but back then. I mean, they got, they got some in the Gulf War, right? But again, you're right. Not, not too many people on the, out in the civilian world probably had a clue. Yeah, I mean, a desert storm was another, you know, talk. We, we've talked about getting rid of the A-10 for a long time. We still are. Uh, but, you know, desert storm was another opportunity where the A-10 really proved itself. But mm -hmm. then things quieted down. We start talking about getting rid of the A-10 and we're kind of right back to there's not really a mission or a purpose. And so the Air Force is again talking about getting rid of the A-10. Um, obviously, 9-11 changed everything uh, with that. Yeah. So Kim, tell us about finally getting to the A-10 and getting trained up on this airframe, what that was like for you. And, and if yeah. you can give us for the civilian crowd out there, people who don't know, if you can give us a little familiarization with the A-10 Warthog, what this plane is, why it matters, what close air support is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I finally got to, uh, to Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona, where we do our A-10 training in let's see about june of 2001 uh and uh, you go through a lot of academics a lot of things before you can actually fly in the airplane um which is good because you need to go through everything because the first time you fly this airplane you are by yourself it's a single seat fighter specifically designed to for the close air support role to support our troops on the ground it's built around a 30 millimeter gatling gun that's 19 feet long if you look at the A-10 offset, uh, the gun is centered, the nose wheel is off because it is built around this gun. Uh, it, is, uh, it was designed to take hits while performing its mission. So it's very durable. Uh, the, the aircraft itself, the fuel tanks are enclosed in protective foam lining to prevent fire after battle damage. It's cut two very reliable engines. Uh, flight controls are all built with re redundant systems. Uh, with manual backups. Um, so it is, you know, it's designed to take hits while performing its mission. Uh, but it's just a beast. I mean, it's an awesome airplane to fly. And we spent weeks uh, going through all the training, emergency procedures, and then it's finally time. We do some simulators and then we get in the airplane for the first time. And the first time you fly the airplane, 
uh, your instructor is kind of tucked in right behind you, uh, but you're solo. You're in that airplane by yourself and um, you're, you take off and uh, it's honestly not the most exciting ride when you fly the airplane for the first time. I mean, it's exciting to take off and, and then you're doing instrument work and you're so focused on the instruments and following the procedures that you're not really, I don't know, you're not really excited about flying the airplane. Um, and you do that for about 10 rides and then you get to go to the range. And that is really where you become an A-10 pilot is when you go to the range and get the opportunity to shoot the gun for the first time. And uh, that mission is like, everybody's excited about it. Uh, we're not wearing the A-10 pilot patches yet uh, until you fly that ride. Um, but there's a lot of buildup to it and a lot of excitement. Uh, and uh, we go out to the range for the first time. And uh, again, our instructor is tucked in right behind us, kind of watching everything we do. We'll do a couple dry passes, meaning we're not gonna actually shoot anything off the airplane. Um, and then once you kind of prove that you can do that, then they say, all right, it's time for the hot passes. So we let the range controller know we're going hot uh, and then uh, roll in to shoot the gun for the first time. And I, I mean, I can remember it to this day because you pull the trigger and I mean, the jet shakes, you can smell the gun gases, it, like you can see the gun gases out the front. I mean, it's rumbling beneath you. Um, and then we're, we're shooting an inert target, so it's not very exciting. So we get little sparkles off the target, um, which isn't as exciting as it blowing up, but it's a, it's a training range. So we see the sparkles, um, but it's pretty awesome. I mean, that's like, finally, you know, you're an A-10 pilot once you shoot the gun for the first time. Uh, so that was, that was uh, probably my favorite ride out of the entire time uh, at training. And then from there, we go on to just, you know, now we become more advanced where we're practicing not just shooting the gun, but dropping bombs. Then we start bringing, bringing ground troops in to kind of do all of that coordination. So it's really a buildup. You go from really the basics of learning how the airplane flies and then really getting technical and tactical with supporting troops on the ground. Six months uh, program. And so uh, September 11th happened. Uh, 2001, I'm in A-10 training, and uh, we shut down for about a week and then ramped it right back up uh, and finished, I finished my A-10 training December of 2001, uh, moved to Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina and deployed two months later to uh, Afghanistan. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Fast that, and furious. Yeah, <laughs> that that gun, uh, that's it's fixed right on the nose, that, that Gatlin. So do yes. So where you point is where you shoot. Do, do is it difficult as a pilot when you are flying and shooting and trying to stay on target to keep from getting target fixated and you know watching your altitude and everything else that's going on? I would say yes when you first start. Right, you can easily become target fixated. I think you know the more you learn, the more you practice. You just come up with a cross check. You know, you're looking outside, but you're also looking. Inside, you're cross-checking the information in the heads-up display that's all there for you. Um, but we, we would get hammered if we went below altitude uh, that we were supposed to go. Uh, and so you learn very, you know, very early, uh, you will fail the ride and have to redo it if you go below those altitudes uh, because uh, it's unsafe. Am, am, am I crazy if I recall seeing a, a video, like a nose cam video or something of an A-10 pilot flying in Afghanistan doing gun runs in the computer system keeps yelling at the pilot saying like, pull up, pull up, pull up. Yeah. I know which video you're talking about. Yeah. So, right. There's, there's training and there's combat. Right. And uh, we, we do different <laughs> things in combat. I mean, when we are shooting very, so we do some really low uh, strafing where we'll get very low to the ground, very close to the target. We're very accurate that way. Uh, and so we do practice that on the range. It's all controlled, but we do get very low and you will hear the pull up, pull up. Um, we hear that. We call her bitch and Betty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's actually a real person and I've met her, which is pretty no awesome. shit. Uh, yeah. I met her at Oshkosh, totally separate story, but it was really cool. And I did, I said, could you just say pull up? Pull up for me? <laughs> How could you not? Um, so we do practice that on the range and in combat, you know, ideally you're not that close or low to the ground. I mean, we, it's a way to get shot at, but I think um, we do that when 
if there's troops in contact, it's we're very close to, we need to shoot very close to friendly forces. The closer, the lower we get, the more mm -hmm. precise we'll be. So mm -hmm. yeah, I know which video you're talking about. It's it's pretty amazing, uh, you know, but it's what, that's what A-10 pilots do, right? Yeah, we're there to support core. the troops on the ground and we're gonna take more risk um, in the situations when we need it. So I need to give a quick shout out to our sponsor for this uh, episode. It's Sap Gear. You guys can find it at sapgear.com and they make a whole different series of escape and evasion items. We've talked about them on the show a few times before. Necklaces that if you are a pilot, you're a special operator or even like a, somebody working for a non-governmental organization. These are like necklaces and belts and things like this that have uh, handcuff keys and shims and lock picks and all sorts of different escape and evasion tools built into them. Um, so if, God forbid, one of you folks out there gets captured and is uh, illegally detained or taken prisoner, um, they can help you escape. They also make different sorts of... All kinds of great, like uh, electronic gear. They have these little uh, uh, RFID mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, yeah, or NFC tags, or RFID that you can program, put data on it, um, you know, keep your passwords on it, stuff like that. So they have uh, literature uh, also to help, uh, like train you and help you understand how to actually use this equipment, uh, how to escape different types of handcuffs. Like the thing that I liked about their manual was it's not just about American or Western style handcuffs. It's also like old, old handcuffs that you're going to encounter in places like Pakistan, India, Germany places like I don't think that stuff is even in some of the big lock picking manuals. It's like kind of a, a very niche subject. But anyway, that's sapgear.com. If you go there, you can use the promo code team to get 15% off your first order. Um, we've messed around with their gear before, their Faraday bag yeah. that we were carrying around uh, DEF CON, uh, DEF CON yeah. uh, uh, last month or a month or and a half ago. So please go check them out. Speaking of uh, evasion, escape and evasion. Uh, what was SEER school like for you? When did you uh, go to that? It, so I actually did SEER school when I was at the Air Force Academy. Okay. So back in the day, uh, we actually had SEER school there and everybody went through it, whether you were going to be a pilot or not. Uh, SEER school is not fun. I mean, there is not, I don't know that there's Come anything on. fun. <laughs> Come on. There's, there are probably moments of fun, but... Um, Am I so glad I had it? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, for, you know, for someone that almost had to use some of those skills, yeah. um, mm -hmm. I'm thankful to have gone through it. Um, you know, it was taught me a lot about myself, like in terms of what I was capable of handling and doing. And, uh, you know, at the time, you know, when I went to the Air Force Academy, we were still about 12% women. So there, what, there weren't a lot of women uh, around and I, my entire SEER group was men. And, uh, you know, just learning how we work together as small teams, kind of doing survival, um, you know, going through that together and just how we really came together as a team, especially in the uh, resistance compound, which I won't to talk too much about, but solitary confinement is terrible. Uh, really? That was my favorite part. Well, there was moments of it that were okay if I could catch a nap, but I, I mean, finally coming together as a team, like finally seeing the guys back together, like, okay, we can handle this. We can get through it. So, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's, I don't think fun is anything that I would describe it as. All right. I fell asleep in solitary for like 45 minutes. And when I came out, I felt like I'd been asleep for like three days. <laughs> I was like, the exercise is over, right? We're going home now. <laughs> I'm impressed they let you sleep that long. <laughs> they were yelling at me over the intercom, but I was I was just too far gone at that point. I, I didn't I slept yeah. like a baby. Yeah. It was just infiltrating his dreams. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you your shortly after you graduated, you went to Afghanistan. What was your first tour like? What was your first combat flight like? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um we uh so we deployed first for Operation Southern Watch in Kuwait. Okay. Um and so we were doing combat search and rescue alert there, which in all reality wasn't very exciting. We were supporting kind of the no fly zone in Southern Iraq, but for the A-10 community meant we were flying racetrack patterns um, just on alert in case someone got shot down. Um, at the same time, you know, 9-11 had just happened. We're kind of ready to get in the fight. I mean, for us, that's like, that's what we do, right? right. So we're ready to get in the fight. And uh, we eventually start moving A-10s over to Afghanistan. 
Uh, and so I was, I was pretty anxious to get ready and get going, but I was, you know, I'm, I'm a young wingman. I mean, I have barely any hours in the airplane. And so I wasn't really sure if I would get that opportunity. Um, but I, I finally did. And uh, we, we were over in Afghanistan, I think maybe June timeframe of 2001. Um, it was eerily quiet. You know, my first, my very first combat mission was, uh, you know, just convoy escort overhead watch. And uh, that was really how I spent a lot of the deployment. Um, there's a little bit of frustration, I think, at times, just because we were we were ready to take the fight to the enemy. I mean, we were ready. We were, you know, there. We 9/11 had happened, and we we just, you know, we kind of wanted to, you know, do something, and it didn't feel like we were really doing anything. Mm -hmm. And then on one mission, uh, we were out, and we were just we were. They gave it. We got coordinates, so we were supposed to just look at coordinates and make sure there was nothing happening at these coordinates. You know, we didn't have a lot of information. We were told the convoy was coming through, and we, you know, for like thirty minutes, we're staring at these spots on the ground, can't see anything. And finally, you know, the radio starts coming alive, and it's a, a convoy. And this guy that came over the radio, I mean, I could hear the fear in his voice. And they had gotten word of an ambush. They had no controller with them, no uh, JTAC joint terminal attack controller with them. And they had, they think there's going to be an ambush. And, and we spent probably an hour with them, just taking them from where we picked them up to their forward operating base. Um, and it really changed my mindset. It really was like, you know, even though we didn't expend ordnance, we didn't drop anything, we didn't shoot anything just by being overhead. I don't know, maybe we stopped an ambush just yeah. because we were overhead and we're screaming down low. But that was a, honestly a lot of my first deployment was just overhead, being overhead, being there, um, other than supporting a, a few night raids uh, for special forces. I mean, for the most part, very quiet, which was very strange, you know, after 9-11 that that's, that's kind of how things were. I mean, this was after Operation Anaconda. So things at that point, you know, were very, very quiet. And how long were your deployments as an A-10 pilot? It started as four months. Uh, they went to five months. They went to six months. So, so by the time you know my fourth deployment to Afghanistan, I think we were at six months, six month rotations. But I think that first one was just four months. Right. And so, how many deployments did you do to Afghanistan before two thousand? Before the invasion in two thousand three? Just one. So I spent. That first time in Afghanistan, young wingman, you know, no, not many hours in the airplane. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's amazing how, how experienced we got very quickly because we, you know, we did Afghanistan and uh, our unit turned very quickly around to Iraq in 2003. Right. So we, we were home for a few months and, uh, and then we turned around to go to Iraq and, you know, it's, it's interesting because I don't think we were supposed to go. Like, I think it was supposed to be our sister squadron and our squadron commander was like, we're ready. Take us, uh, take the 75th fighter squadron. And uh, we, we all supported that. I mean, we wanted to go, you know, we, it was, I think, you know, it's one of those things. I think it's like, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but with sports, right. You don't really want to just do all your training and then never play in the game right. and just sit on the bench and watch you if your team is going, if the guys are on the ground, then we want, we want to be there, right? We want to be there to support that. So we were, we're all very supportive of, of going to Iraq. And uh, we ended up leaving uh, and arrived. We, we left late February, arrived into uh, Kuwait again in, on March 1st, 2003 uh, okay. for the buildup. And then Iraqi freedom. The invasion was like for the air, I guess it was like Mar uh, what, March 19th. 20th, somewhere around there. And what for the A-10, because you had all the fast moves out there on their bombing runs. Yep. For your operations, what were your guys, what were you guys doing? So we were tasked to push with the army. Uh, and so we, uh, as the army moved forward, we moved forward with them. So it was pretty eye-opening for us when they said, yeah, you're going to go all the way to Baghdad because Baghdad, uh, if you look at a, a map from that has the surface to air engagement zones on it, it's surrounded by, by what we call the super mes, a missile engagement zone. I mean, there are missiles all over Baghdad. So for an airplane that's really meant for low to medium threat environment, uh, 
it was kind of eye opening when they told us that we were going all the way to Baghdad. Um, you know, we had obviously we had support of other aircraft along the way, um, but that was our tasking. And so we, we, you know, we had kind of conversations like, I'm not sure we're going to bring everybody home. Like yeah. this is uh, this is pretty high threat. And our squadron commander actually made us all write letters home so that if we didn't make it, uh, he would have letters to deliver to our family. He told us we couldn't fly until we wrote those letters. Uh, that was eye opening. Uh, and where, where is your where is your husband during all of this? Because he's a A ten guy, also, right? Yeah. So my husband's in the sister squadron uh, that didn't get to go. Okay. Okay. Uh, which is always a little sore spot for him because uh, they <laughs> probably should have gone, and we went instead. Uh, he ended up. He was a, a at this point he pretty experienced A ten pilot, weapons officer, uh, which is our version uh, of the of Top Gun. So weapons officer. And uh, he ended up deploying with special forces on the ground to do some uh, work as an air, we'll call it an air liaison officer uh, for that perspective, just helping them with air support. So uh, he eventually got to fly, uh, but he spent a lot of time on the ground initially. What do you know, did you guys ever get any visibility on why they sent A-10s down a missile core, a service to air corridor? Because like you said, your planes aren't really cut out for that. What did somebody yeah. just not understand your the, your 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 aircraft capability and mission? Uh, I think the intent was we, we would take out those missiles. We meaning the U.S. Air Force, not A-10s, uh, would take all the 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 key missiles out before we got there. Um, so that was the intent that they'd start striking all those missile sites. And as we moved forward and got closer to Baghdad, uh, we had what we call suppression of enemy air defense. So C platforms would go out in front of us and they would kind of soften the area so that we could then go in. Because I mean, our whole focus is the ground troops. So we don't really want to be worried about all the other right. missiles, but um, you know, it was, it was always really interesting. The closer we got to Baghdad, we have on our airplane, something called a, a radar warning receiver. And that thing just nonstop chirping. And so you're constantly trying to figure out, you know, what's looking at you, what the threat is, um, you know, kind of what's going on on the ground. Do you need to move out? Do you need to move up? Uh, it was just kind of a constant analysis of, of the threat and what's going on and the risks that you're willing to take to support the ground troops. That I, I can't imagine how insane that would be, you know, just how on this like on the ball you had to be at that point in time yes yeah, so, i mean tell us about that about going into baghdad yeah. for the invasion you know it was um the first day i remember i think probably one of my first couple sorties like just seeing this mass of troop movement i mean you could see this dust trail um because you know honestly we were moving so fast initially um, and it was just this massive dust trail towards Baghdad. And then it, and then it slowed down dramatically as we got closer to Baghdad. Um, you know, there were days that we would launch on a mission and we'd come back with all our ordnance. I mean, we'd come back with everything. There were no targets. There was no threat. It was just eerily quiet. And, uh, we finally got smart and, uh, we were stationed in Kuwait with the Marines as well. And the Marines were always, they'd come back and they'd have, you know, their ordinance is gone. And they're like, yeah, there wasn't enough, you know, there's so much to do today. We didn't have enough airplanes. And so we finally started working this plan that we, in the morning before we took off, we would brief with the, the army ground liaison officer, the GLOW. And then when we were done with him, we'd go in the Marine uh, talk, uh, tactical operations center, and we'd talk to the Marines and figure out what their scheme and maneuver was for the day. So now you know, instead of taking off, if the, if the army didn't need us because there was nothing to attack or they weren't facing any resistance, they'd actually send us over to the Marines, uh, which actually made a lot of sense, you know. So we, we figured that out pretty quickly. So we bounced back and forth between kind of the west side and the east side of the area of operations um, and just, you know, just whatever needed to be done. I mean, that's the thing about the A-10. You take off, you don't know you might know a general idea of where you're going, but you don't really know what you're going to be tasked to do until it happens. I mean, it, it changed. You, you, you'd print all the, we had maps for everywhere. I mean, the entire country. Um, and uh, at the time we didn't have a, this nice moving map display where, you know, just all in the system, we had paper maps and we just 
toss them all up in the front of the uh, canopy and we'd pull out maps for wherever we were going. So uh, flexibility was, uh, I mean, you cannot adapt or you cannot perform if you can't adapt to that flexibility. I mean, you just, you have to be able to adjust. It sounds like you're taking a road trip to Florida or something, a bunch of road atlas yeah. up in the dashboard. The old school, all the, the paper maps and the atlases. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what it was. You had to be ready to take out for whatever map you're going. Um, well, and, and then as we got closer to Baghdad, then it was almost more traditional in terms of we got certain um, kill boxes that we would go to. So a certain, if you want to call it like a square on a map, and you guys are familiar, but you know, certain space. And we kind of got familiar with the ones that we were always seeing action in. Um, and that's where really the close air support happened was when we, when we got to Baghdad. We did a lot of almost interdiction before that, where we were dropping on uh, weapons, caches, you know, uh, fill this buildings and facilities for enemy troops, things like that. Uh, tanks out in the open. We did a lot of that. Um, and then we finally kind of got to the point where now the army is receiving effective fire. And, and we're we, once we kind of got to that early April stage, uh, we were doing a lot of close air support and supporting troops on the ground. When, when you guys are flying like that, if, particularly for like the weapons caches and things like that, like what is your cruising altitude? So generally we like to, we'll stay up high if we can, right? There's no reason to go into that threat envelope. So right. you know, we can stay up at 20,000 feet if we can. Um, you know, back then we did not have the capability to drop precision munitions. So right. everything right. is point at the ground and drop it uh, to, to hit the target. And, uh, you know, but we tried to stay high as much as possible to th stay out of the threat envelope. Really the only time we got low was troops in contact, uh, weather, uh, was another factor that drove us lower. Um, but otherwise we tried to stay high I and mean, there was no reason to get down low and get into the threat if we didn't have to. Cause some of those weapons caches were very, like they're very dangerous for pilots that because of what they were composed of, they, I mean, they would blow sky high. We dropped one day in Southern Baghdad. I, I don't remember exactly where it was at. And uh, they told us about this site. When we went to the site, we initially saw missiles and we're, you know, then we're like, wait, we got to stand off. <laughs> right. Well, we, turns out the missiles were decoys because we, we dropped on them and they like, puff, you know, did nothing. Um, and, uh, but we had seen some like tank tracks and things like that. It was very clearly an enemy area and they, uh, we got approval to take the building out, which is, you know, there's a lot of approval that goes into dropping on a building mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that it's clearly identifiable as enemy and uh, we dropped on a building and the, it was like, like a fireworks factory. I don't know. I mean, it was just stuff was going off everywhere. And it's the color of smoke was not normal. It was like reddish orange and brown. It was, it was eye opening. I mean, that was when we suddenly were like, I think we're going to stay even higher to get, right. we don't want to be anywhere near the smoke that's coming up. Um, but that was, that was a huge building. We dropped everything we had. Uh, on that building and kind of in that vicinity. Um, and it was eye-opening to see the explosions that came from that. Wow. Can you tell us about some of the times when the Marines or the Army needed close air support and they, they called uh, upon, you know, your services? Yeah, those are, I mean, the air interdiction, the dropping on the buildings is, you know, is one thing, but um, Troops in contact is one of those things that like if an A-10 pilot hears that over the radio, it's suddenly like you're so focused. You're, it's like game on. Like it is, we have to perform at the highest level right now. Um, and whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan, I mean, we just, it was like our, everything went into focus at that moment of getting the nine line, getting all the information of, you know, where the friendlies are at, where the enemy is at gathering target information, but then getting in there as fast as you can. Um, I think for me, you know, my most memorable mission is the April 7th mission of supporting our ground troops. And that was a day where the weather was terrible. Um, you know, we, we flew up to Baghdad, air refueled, and then we just waited in these stacks. You know, at that point, you know, we're talking five, six, seven, April, we're just doing, we're running aircraft stacks around Baghdad now because there's so much contact with the enemy that people are they're just pulling aircraft from the stack as quickly as they can 
But on April 7th, the weather was terrible. I mean, we couldn't see the ground below. We, we did not think we were going to be able to do anything. Uh, and we, we waited, we waited, and, uh, and then got the call that there was a troops in contact. And, you know, it's just everything comes into, the, into focus at that moment in terms of what you have to do and how quickly you have to get in there. Um, we wrote everything down as quickly as we could. We actually write most things down with a grease pencil on our canopy. Um, it's just a quick way to have everything right there, um, plot all the information on our maps, uh, and then get moving. I mean, the A-10 isn't all that fast. Uh, <laughs> so we want to get over to the target area as quickly as we can. But we got over the target area, we could still couldn't see the ground below. Um, but wow. uh, when you hear troops in contact, it's it's one of those things where you're going to do everything you can. So my flight lead said, look, we're going to get down below the weather. We're going to find a way. And uh, I remember we're just, he, he told me we're going to do, we're going to plan on the gun. It's just straightforward. Um, the situation was that our guys were on the west side of the Tigris River, enemies over on the east side of the Tigris River, which is very nice to have that nice, clearly identifiable river. It doesn't yeah. always happen that way. Um, and then we were, so our target was the enemy hiding underneath um, what we referred to as the North Baghdad Bridge. And um, my flight lead said, all right, we're going to go in. We'll use the 30 millimeter to strafe underneath the bridge. And uh, we just got to get down below the weather. So I remember he like saw this hole and he just disappeared. He was gone. <laughs> he was just like, hole in the clouds, I'm going. Uh, and all of a sudden I'm like above the weather, I'm by myself. And I'm like, all right, this is interesting. And then he says, all right, Casey, you can come down below the weather too. And I uh, found a hole in the clouds and just as fast as I could to dive down through. And then uh, got down below the weather and now we're low uh, and I can see the firefight. I mean, I had not before this, I don't think I've quite experienced that where I could actually see like the, just the smoke and the tracer, everything just yeah, very yeah. clearly back and forth across the river. Um, and uh, it's that half second of like, surreal you know this is like this is everything that we talk about everything that we train for um, and how, and then how, how, like, how high de how high off the deck are you at this point uh we're at about six to seven thousand feet okay uh, which is not a that's not a good place for it tends to be uh, we're we're highlighted against the sky you know now the gray clouds and you've got our airplane underneath um and we're trying to just stay as high as we can out of the kind of the, you know, try not to get shot at by just small arms fire. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but trying to get in there pretty quick. So my flight late immediately, I think I'm just getting down below the weather and he strafes uh, from North to South on the enemy location and the ground controller immediately comes back with not effective. You got to come in from South to North. So now we're below the weather. We're coming in from one way uh, to, to uh, take out the enemy. We use gun, a couple passes or, well, one pass each of guns, and then we switch to rockets trying to just uh, spread out the fire a little bit and uh, using high explosive rockets. And I remember that at this point, my flight leader was like, hey, we, we need to, we're going to do one more pass and then we got to get our energy back. We got to reassess the situation because it was, you know, at this point we had started to see like these puffs of gray and white smoke flashes in the air next to us. Uh, so we're just trying to keep our jet moving, but trying to get in there pretty quickly. Uh, and uh, that is uh, that last rocket pass came off target, got the rockets right underneath the bridge, came off target, and then just felt and heard this huge explosion at the back of the airplane. Uh, there was no doubt in my mind. I knew I knew immediately that I had been hit. Um, at this point, the jet kind of nosed over. Uh, I'm looking down at Baghdad below, and I pull back on the pulled back on the control stick and nothing like absolutely nothing oh, happened. Shit. Yeah. It's kind of that moment of like, Oh, <laughs> now what, you know, I'm my airplanes, I can see Baghdad. Like it's getting closer. My airplane's not responding. I don't know exactly how much time had passed. Cause I didn't really have a good indication, but time definitely slowed down in that moment of like, just, I remember seeing the Tigris River. I remember like the colors. I remember looking outside. There was this half second of like, okay, if I have to eject, I think there's this green patch of grass, but it was on the east. I was over the east side of the river at that point, like right, right where the enemy was. Right. So those thoughts are going through my mind. And uh, I honestly, I went back to my training. I went back to our basic, you know, 
you know, maintain aircraft control, analyze the situation, take the proper action, and then land as soon as conditions permit. But it was like, okay, I got to get this airplane under control. Like that is primary. I have to do that. Um, but I got to figure out what's wrong. So I remember running through everything and then looking at, we have a caution panel and it's like, I don't know, remember, there's probably, I don't know, I'm going to say 36 lights. Some A-10 pilot out there, correct me. I don't know how many lights are on it, but uh, the, it felt like half of them or more of them were on and the lights are lit up. And I remember looking at the top lights, which are our hydraulic lights for pressure and reservoir. They're all four of them for the left and right side are on. I look up at my hydraulic gauges and they're at zero. Like they're, the whole system is just depleted. Um, at this point, I know that the only thing I can do other than ejecting is to put the aircraft in our backup emergency mode called manual reversion, which now wire guided. disconnects. What's that? Well, like it's flown by wire. Yes, it's, it's, that's what you do. I mean, you take the hydraulics off the airplane, which I had none anyway, and now you're flying on old school, like cranks and cables. Um, so it's almost like going from power steering to manual only in an airplane where it actually really matters. Yes. I don't, it's supposed to be harder to control, but in that moment, I don't, I didn't notice. Like everybody said, oh, did you feel much pressure on the stick? And I was like, no, because I pulled back on the stick and it started to climb. Like that's <laughs> all I cared about. Um, and so like, finally, like once I did that and the airplane started to climb away from the ground, I was like, all right, I might, I might actually survive this. Like I, you know, I have a long way to go, but I might actually survive this. Um, somewhere in there, I let my flight lead know that I've been hit. Uh, neither of us saw the missile coming, unfortunately. It, 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 I mean, I, we're jumping the gun a little bit here, but yeah. you, you did come to find out it was a missile. I mean, I saw the picture that you sent us. Like, the enemy vibe checked you pretty good that day. Like, the aircraft was beat up pretty good. Um, what what yeah. was the, the – how, how did it happen? What was the nature of the, the damage to the aircraft? So we never fully knew. Um, our, well, they sent – they wanted to send a – a, essentially like an intel team to evaluate the airplane afterwards and uh the rule at the time was if you're not boots on the ground war fighters you're not coming into theater so they didn't send they ended up not sending them into theater so our in-house intel did an analysis on it and uh what we believe happened is uh, and we sent pictures to the, the people that the experts that look at that kind of stuff they think that that missile hit the back horizontal stabilizer so kind of the horizontal part of the tail. And then the shrapnel from that explosion then went into the fuselage. And uh, well, I could see that myself after I landed, but I could see that it sheared the right hydraulic line completely. And then the left hydraulic line had a hole um, big enough that it depleted the system. So the good news on our airplane is that the hydraulic lines are all separated. The bad news for me on that day was that, uh, you know, it, a lucky hit on their part and that it hit the shrapnel went into a very narrow part of the aircraft and just blew out both the right and left side. And, and uh, any thoughts uh, on what type of missile this was? Like, was it a man pad, like an SA seven or something bit bigger? Some, uh, something bigger. Um, we never really know. Uh, we, we likely know that it was Russian made because there were screws that they could, there were screws left that they found in my airplane oh, um, shit. that were identifiable. But, uh, no, they believe it was likely something bigger than that. Now, when you went to manual mode and started to climb and then kind of work back, were you fighting the plane? Or once you were in that manual mode, was it a fairly safe flight? I don't want to say safe because you had no idea what was going on with the plane, but was it a very yeah. stable flight for you back to base? Uh, no, <laughs> it was it was rough. Um, I was very thankful to like get out of Baghdad and above the weather, right? Like that was like, okay, relief. Like if I have to eject, I'm at least outside of Baghdad, right? right. And out of the city, I probably have a better chance of survival and uh, rescue all of those things. Um, but flying back was, it was difficult. Um, I thankfully had heard from other A-10 pilots who flew during Desert Storm that had flown in manual reversion. And so I had, heard about kind of their stories and how they flew the airplane. It was very heavy. Like the, it was just very difficult to fly. You know, the best thing that I've heard people equate it to, and you said it, is this idea of like driving a car without power steering, right. but it's actually like driving a semi truck or a dump truck without power steering. Right. Which 
haven't done, but it was just, it was like very sluggish and difficult to fly. And because I had emergency jettisoned all my ordnance, so I had, cl- so that I could climb, um, I, if I took my hand off the stick, it just wanted, it would do these rolls because there was a very heavy uh, classified and expensive countermeasures pod out on the left wing. And so it just wanted to roll. Uh, So I was constantly fighting that. It got better once I figured out, you know, what the right airspeed was to fly that worked for my airplane. I kind of got to the point where I was comfortable with it. And then I just took turns of flying, you know, my right hand on the stick, left hand on the stick, both hands on the stick, trying to just make it as normal as possible. Um, But it was pretty exhausting mentally and physically. How long was the flight back? Uh, An hour. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I would like to ask you at this point, too, I am being a it's a single seat fighter, as you describe, which on one hand, that's like kind of cool, right, that you're up there by yourself doing your own thing, living by your wits in a sense, like everything is on you, right? But you control your little world. But now you're up there, you're, you must've felt pretty alone at that moment, trying to limp back, back home. Yes and no. I mean, I, uh, there with me. And so, you know, he flew right up next to me and I could see him at that point. Yeah. He was flying real, real close. Once we, once he rejoined after I got hit, like I could see him out there and it was kind of this reassuring, like, okay, yes, I'm in the cockpit alone, but he's right there and he's going to provide me mutual support. And, you know, I was a young wingman at this time. So he's a, the way we worked our combat pairs is that we would be paired with somebody that was more experienced than us. And so he had a lot of experience. He had flown in desert storm. You know, he was, he was absolutely critical, you know, like, that moment when I got hit, you know, and I told him that I was hit, you know, I'm so task saturated, focused, trying to just fly the airplane. (laughs) And he's telling me to put out more chaff and flare to move to the West side of the river in case I have to eject, you know, to jettison all my ordnance. So having him for that mutual support was huge. Um, But it's still a single seat fighter. Right. And so he, he at one point says, uh, Casey, you need to, start thinking out, thinking about if you want to eject or stay with the airplane and try to land. And I knew this because I was in manual aversion. Like I knew this, that I was going to have to make this decision. But then when he finally said it out loud, I was like, Ugh. you know, how do you make that choice? Like, what's the right choice? I don't right. know. I mean, it was just, there was part of me that was hoping that he would just make the decision. Right. That would be really easy. Um, but he was like, hey, you're, you're flying a single seat fighter and the choice is yours and I will back you up no matter what, um, which was awesome. Like the fact that he had that much faith and confidence and trust in me. Um, I, I recently watched, there was an ABC News episode that interviewed him after this happened. And he, and he was just so matter of fact about it. He was like, yeah, she's a good pilot. I let her make the decision. You know, I just... I can't imagine being him and having to let me make that decision at the same time. But, um, you know, I, I had an hour to fly the airplane and really get a feel for it. I knew that I could eject at the last minute if I needed to. Um, we have a zero, zero seat, meaning you can eject at zero feet, zero knots, and it's still supposed to be effective. Oh, really? So, yeah, I mean, I, I knew all of that. I yeah. just, you know, right. That, that airplane is so nice and warm and safe and there's a titanium bathtub around it. Like, I'm like, I don't want to jump out of this thing. <laughs> right. And, and, um, but the, but the alternative to that is landing this beast <laughs> yeah. in manual yeah. mode where you're kind of wrestling with it, wrestling it the whole way to the ground in a, yeah. in a stable position. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, it was one of those things where I, I evaluated, evaluated the situation as best I could. You know, we kind of thought through the pros and cons. I mean, we did decide to uh, go all the way back to Kuwait and not land at Talil uh, Air Base, which we had, I guess, owned, taken over at the time. Um, I mean, these are the conversations we're having. He's My flight lead's like, well, there's only a fire truck there. There's no ambulance. There's no hospital. So let's go all the way to Kuwait so that if something happens, you at least have the support team behind you. Um, you know, so we're, we're talking through those hard conversations and, uh, 
I just decided, you know, I'm going to fly it for a while and then make a decision. And uh, after flying it for a while, I was like, you know, it's fine. What I thought was pretty well and um, knew that we'd have to get back into friendly territory, friendly territory, do what we call a controllability check to slow it down. I had to see if I could get the gear down. I mean, none of that stuff was working. Right. Um, and so once we went through that, then I was like, okay, now I feel pretty comfortable with this decision. So that's, is the landing gear based on the hydraulic system too? Did you have to do a manual with the landing? I did. So landing gear, brakes, you name oh my it. It's gosh. all with hydraulics. Uh, but we have, again, you know, we have all these backup modes. So we have a, a way to extend the gear without hydraulics. Um, we have, uh, you know, ways to brake without hydraulics. Not very many uh, options to brake, but it was all built to take these hits. And so so how, um, how do you lower the landing gears? They're like a little windshock. Like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> And the brake is like like Fred Flintstone, like on the <laughs> the cart break. on the ground. <laughs> it's actually it's it's pretty in, impressive that you know <laughs> that the des designers designed it this way. But if you look at the A10, the gear come up this way. So all that you pull a lever, you pull out the lever, and it releases these up locks oh, that hold the gear in place, and then they kind of come down into the slipstream um, into the wind. And so it takes a long time. I, I felt to me like it was this. I don't know. I was just staring at these lights. You know, you have three green lights that tell you when each gear is down and locked. And I just stared at those things. It felt like forever. I mean, it was not very long, but it felt like it took forever to see three green lights. But I needed those to light. Up, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of critical. So, at, at what point did you decide one hundred percent that you were going to land that bird? Uh, once we were back in Kuwait. And the controllability check was done. Um, as soon as I put the gear down, uh, it there was some kind of the airplane became a little bit harder to control until I got to the right airspeed. And once I figured out what that airspeed was and I could maintain that airspeed, I felt very comfortable. Um, and so it was honestly my final decision was right before we kind of got into Kuwait, got closer to the runway. And I was like, all right, I'm going to continue with my final approach, knowing that I could still eject at that mm -hmm. point. And you get your three green lights by some miracle. And tell us about putting this thing down on the runway. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> uh, I remember coming down for the final approach. And as I'm coming in, um, the controller in the tower, they had sent another A-10 pilot up there happened to be a good friend of mine. And uh, I remember hearing him say like, Hey, if you still want to eject, like the rescue helicopters are there for you. And he kind of gave me the location and, you know, it's just that, okay, I'm all right. I, I know they're there. Thank you. I'm hopefully do not need them. And they said the, the rescue uh, team, the uh, crash recovery team is waiting for you. I'm like, Oh, great. I don't yeah. use them either. Yeah. Thanks way to build that. you up. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's reassuring that like they're all there. Right. Uh, but, right. You know, I don't, I don't want to use you. Um, and then I, you know, as I came in down on the final approach, I just, I think I was so focused. I just, we had learned from desert storm that um, you can't pull back the power in manual reversion, which is what we do on every landing. So this landing was going to be different because I could not touch the power to slow down um, because in the, in manual reversion, if you pull that power back, the nose dumps. Right. So if you're pulling, the, if you're pulling the power back and you're close to the runway, the nose is going to dump, hit the runway first, and you're going to cartwheel right. down the runway and fireball. So I, I had that on my mind and uh, just actually put my left hand up on the uh, cockpit, uh, just the glare shield because I, I didn't want to accidentally do it. I didn't want to pull the power. I was very focused on doing a Navy style carrier landing uh, because it was it was going to be a power on really just fly the airplane straight to the ground. No mm -hmm. flare, just fly it to the ground. And uh, I think, I'm not sure I was breathing at that point. I think I was just holding my breath, hoping that it was all going to go okay. Um, I remember making my gear down call, trying to sound like calm and controlled. And, you know, while I'm sure my heart was just beating at an incredible pace at that point. Um, but when all three wheels hit the ground. It was such a feeling of relief. It was just like, thank you, God. Like I made it like, 
and then I had to get the airplane stopped because right, you know, right. now I'm using another emergency <laughs> procedure um, of having just five brake applications and uh, eventually got the airplane stopped. And I think for me, honestly, the best part was like all the guys in my squadron had been um, several. So one of them was in the control tower. A few of them were in airplanes waiting to launch and we broke every radio etiquette when I landed. I mean, just the, like the cheers over the radio and hearing their voices, like was just this, like, I was, I don't know that I've ever felt that overwhelmed with like relief and emotion and like camaraderie with my team of like how much they were there for me. It was, it was pretty damn cool. So when you got out of the plane where you're like, easy day where you're like, Oh my God, thank <laughs> no God. big deal boys. Yeah. That's how you do it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I tried. Uh, you know, funny. I, uh, I got out of the airplane and um, a bunch of Marines met me at the airplane. They were the firefighters there. And, uh, you know, I had to try to tell them how to get the ladder open. And so I could jump out of the airplane. And, uh, I remember hopping out of the airplane and they're looking at me and I'm like, what? Like, I, you know, what is the, and they're just kind of staring at me and they're like, wow. So I walked to the back of the airplane and like, it is just, it's dripping with hydraulic fluid. I, I there's probably 600 holes in the airplane. Uh, the whole backside of the jet is black. It's like charred and, and from, and just again, dripping hydraulic fluid. Um, you could push on the airplane. It was soft to the touch. There were pieces of the tail oh that were God. no longer, the metal part was no longer there. And I started looking at the airplane and I realized that those holes that I thought were all in the back end, because I couldn't see this from the airplane. I mean, I had no idea what the damage looked like other than my flight lead's description. And I'm looking at the holes and they're getting closer and closer to the cockpit. Like they're at the end, there's shrapnel holes on the engine. They're down kind of in the front part. And I, you know, it's, there's a bit of a moment of realization of like how, how big the hit was and how lucky I was and how thankful I was to have been flying the A-10, right? Like the jet was built to take hits. Yeah. Um, but it was still one of those moments of like, that was really impressive to see that that airplane could fly that well, even after all that battle damage. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, I think you you deserve massive amounts of recognition, and you did get a distinguished uh, flying cross for it, correct? You know, it, I did. It, yeah. It's so impressive. How did you process that, like in the days, in the following days? Um, you know, I think I was on an adrenaline high for for at least you know got me through that day. Um, I think that night I sat down. Someone gave me the advice to write in a journal not a really a journal person, but thank God I did. I have, I have like my thoughts from that mission on that day. And I think kind of putting it all down on paper and just thinking through it all um, was a, a bit of a way for me to decompress. I had to call my parents because my squadron commander made me call my parents. I, you know, I was like, can I just wait? Like, yeah, nobody will hear about this. Like there's a war <laughs> going on. We got stuff to do. And my squadron commander was like, I uh, know you'll call your parents. So I called my parents, woke them up at one o'clock in the morning in California. And, uh, you know, they, uh, <laughs> I couldn't tell them what happened. I just said, Hey, I had a rough day. I just want you to know I'm okay. Um, I was able to call my husband, thankfully. Um, you know, he was working at a classified location. So I had the ability to tell him everything through a classified phone. Um, thank God he was asleep when this happened though. He was working a different shift and he did not know about it until after I landed. I was wondering if um, anybody had like reached out to him or if he had heard through the grapevine while it was going on. He found out because in the morning he was coming in for his shift like normal. And uh, he, uh, I think his two-star boss stopped him and was like, hey, soup, it's his call sign. Uh, I heard about your wife and I'm really glad she's okay. And he's like, what the hell is going <laughs> oh, on? Oh, man. And uh, he had a note on his laptop because I had, I had tried to call him and it, uh, was from his uh, intelligence officer and it said, Hey, soup, your wife got hit over Baghdad. She's okay, but you should give her a call. <laughs> uh, so that's how he found out. And of course word got out very quickly. Sure. I'm glad I called my parents because they, my dad had been in the air force, was an Academy graduate. And this was the early stages of like digital media. So someone had taken digital pictures and they went out on email and he got them. He didn't, you know, there, I wasn't in the picture. So 
uh, but putting that with my phone call, he, he knew right. what had happened. Um, and then the distinguished flying cross came after we got home. I, it's one of those moments, like I'm honored, right? Like you look at, I look at all the people that have received a distinguished flying cross. And I remember standing there, like they're reading the citation and it's just like, did I really earn this? Like I was just doing my job, right? Like right. it's just, this is what we do. I mean, we support troops on the ground and my airplane got hit and I brought it home, but what else was I going to do? You know, it's a single seat fighter. Like this is, this is what we do as A-10 pilots. I think well, any other A-10 pilot would have done the same. Prob maybe, but I mean, you could have ejected, like you didn't have to land yeah. the bird. You know what I mean? Like there were yeah. a lot of easier choices that you could have made that, that day from the beginning yeah. to the end. Yeah. You know, sadly the airplane never flew again. Like it was um, unfortunately too, too far gone, uh, too many holes and, and uh, not enough time to repair it. Um, but thankfully they took every part that they could out of that airplane maintenance. Uh, we call it canned. They, they took like, they took the ejection seat out. They took the gun out. They took every piece and part that they could use to then fix other airplanes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I got a few pieces for myself too. So that was nice. They gifted a few to me. You know what we haven't asked you about is tell us about Killer Chick. Where, <laughs> where did where did that come from? And so fighter pilots get their call sign as soon as we are um, deemed combat mission ready, right? So we have to go through an upgrade where they're like, they check us off and they're like, all right, we would deploy with you. You know, we'd take you to combat. And when you're to get a call sign, uh, at least in the A-10 community, the way we did it was uh, in the bar on a Friday night, uh, as most good things happen in a fire <laughs> squadron. And uh, you're not actually in the room when they, so they talk about you behind your back while you're out in the hallway and they come up with all these great names. Some of them are total jokes, um, but the stories they tell only have to be 10% true. Uh, so you never really know what you're gonna, <laughs> what you're gonna get. Um, but for me, I mean, being an A-10 pilot, being the only female in the squadron, uh, killer chick just seemed to be very fitting. Um, but nobody calls me that. Everybody just calls me KC, which also happens to be my initials. And so most people just assume it's that. So. I did. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah, I did. No, that's awesome, though. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, there are a lot worse call signs. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with killer yeah, chick. Yeah, for sure. So in every Tom Cruise movie, something that he's like a badass and then something bad happens and then he loses his nerve and then he has to get back on back in his game. Right. Whatever, whatever movie it is. Uh, like, did it take you a while to warm back up to the is idea there of like flying? a montage scene of you in the gym? Yeah. Yeah. I wish it was that taking cool. long walks, uh, <laughs> taking long walks with your a 10 right riding a motorcycle. Yeah. Yeah, we're in Kuwait. There's no motorcycles. There's no, well, there's a gym, but I don't know. I think they had closed some of the gyms down. They had closed like all the fun stuff down at the time. Um, you know, I, so my flight lead the next day, uh, sign, I'm pretty sure he signed us up for combat search and rescue alert. Like thinking that normally on those combat search and rescue alert missions, you go out to the alert shack next to the runway, you play video games, you read, you sleep, you do whatever, but it's a, it's a down day, essentially. I should have, I should ask him. I don't know if he did this intentionally, but that was our mission the next day. And uh, so this is April 8th and hanging out next to the runway in the alert shack. I think I was sleeping uh, and the alarm sounds like not a drill. The alarm sounds at A-10 pilot has been shot down in Baghdad. So we raced out to the jets as fast as we could. We stopped to get just our gear on and then we, we took, an, we took a, a, an immediate takeoff. And we start gathering information. Where's the pilot? What shot him down? Well, he's, you know, he's up in Baghdad, right? Pretty close to where I had escaped my own shoot down. And uh, we're trying to figure out his condition. Where is he at? Where are the closest rescue helicopters? You know, doing all the things that we normally do on a combat search and rescue mission. And we made it about 30 minutes into Iraq and the uh, uh, AWACS, the Airborne Warning Control Center, uh, tells us you can turn around. And on our inner flight frequency, my flight leads like, I'm not turning around. There's an A-10 pilot on the ground. They didn't really give us any other information. I mean, 
I, I don't know if we thought they were idiots, but like there's a radar. They can see that we're not turning around. <laughs> right. So the controller <laughs> right. finally comes over the radio and he's like, hey, Sandy flight, the pilot's been picked up. You can turn around. Um, and amazing. I mean, this pilot uh, had got shot down and friendly ground troops watched his parachute and airplane go in uh, and were able to pick him up. So mm. he was really lucky. But that's how I got back in the air. You know, it was like the no time to think about it. Pilot shot down. Those guys were gonna there for me the day before. I'm doing the same thing for this pilot. Um, so it was just like, you know, get back on the horse, right? Like I just, I didn't have time to think about it. So I think honestly, that was the best way for me to get back in the airplane. Yeah. To not dwell on it, not think about it. Yeah. I took the approach of compartmentalize, put it away and deal with it later. Yeah. I don't, uh, I'm not a mental health technician or doctor. I don't know that that's the best approach, but it worked for me. Yeah. I just kind of tucked it away. Didn't, didn't really think about it or deal with it until I got home. That's, it's an amazing story, Casey. I, I, it's incredible. So what was, uh, what was the next step in your career, uh, from there? You know, it's crazy. This was 2003, right? Mm, like early. I, I was like, I think I was a captain at the time. I mean, I new to the A-10 community, uh, you know, at that point, um, we came home from that, uh, actually, while we were still on that deployment, I upgraded to flight lead. So I went from wingman to becoming a flight lead while we were in Iraq. Granted, the, the missions quieted down, quieted down a bit, but I came home from combat as a two ship flight lead. Um, so now I'm leading A-10s in combat and uh, came home, quickly upgraded to four ship flight lead and then instructor and uh, did another deployment to Afghanistan. And, uh, and then kind of, you know, at that point went on with my career, uh, spent some time at the 422 test and evaluation squadron, uh, upgrading the A-10 from the A-10A to the A-10C. So we finally got all the Gucci precision engagement upgrades and targeting pods, all those fancy things that we wish we had um, in those early days, uh, spent some time there doing that, uh, did school and some staff tours, uh, found myself back in the A-10 and deploying again to Afghanistan, uh, spent some time on the ground, uh, working as a, um, at the, uh, ISAF joint command headquarters, uh, doing air operations as an individual augmentee, not flying worst deployment I've, <laughs> I will say that I've ever done. And the only one that I wasn't excited to go on, like yeah. all of the others, I was just fired up, wanted to be there, felt the camaraderie of a team. Uh, and now I'm a, a major, I've got a two-year-old at home mm. and they're like, hey, we've got another deployment for you, but you're not flying and you don't get to go with your squadron. I'm like, mm. it's probably my low point um, in the Air Force. Yeah. So much so that I told my husband, I'm like, I'm getting out. I'm not doing this. You know, I'm, this is not what I signed up for. In truth, it is, right? We sign up for whatever the Air Force tells us to do. But uh, for an A-10 pilot working as a staff officer uh, on the ground in Kabul wasn't, uh, wasn't really what I wanted. Right. Um, you know, in hindsight, though, I look back at that deployment and uh, met some incredible people doing amazing things from all over the world. Um, it went by fast. My son, who was two is now 14 and doesn't remember any of it. Right. So you didn't get out though. You were a major, I mean, you retired yeah. as a Colonel. So how, what happened when you, <laughs> were you able to control your destiny a little bit more after that trip? A little bit. I mean, I got home and they're all like, Hey, uh, you, you know, you, you paid the price. Uh, you know, you want to come over and be the, the deputy for a fighter squadron. I'm like, uh, hell yes. You know, it's a squadron where we're training the next generation of pilots you know, how do you say no to that? Right. And I, I think I also felt like I had a responsibility. Like I learned a lot from flying and combat and I felt like I had a responsibility to help train and teach that next generation of A-10 pilots. Uh, so I spent some time doing that. Not very much time uh, because I ended up uh, right very quickly after that uh, uh, promoting to Lieutenant Colonel and uh, took over as a squadron commander um, spent some time there. And then as, uh, as everybody does, if you stay in long enough, I spent some time in the Pentagon, thankfully with my husband, and uh, we spent some time there together, um, had another kid, <laughs> and uh, had another boy, another son, and, uh, and uh, spent some time there 
really doing some different things. You know, that was where I moved away from the tactical of A-10 flying and spent a year at the Atlantic Council uh, in, the, in a think tank, um, seeing kind of how things are done at, in the DC environment at the more strategic level. And then went on to be the military assistant to the undersecretary um, of defense for policy. And uh, that was fascinating because now I'm seeing how all the decisions are made. Um, and I worked for Christine Wormuth, who is now the secretary of the army. And, you know, she, it was, I, I felt so empowered by her because she just, she was always asking my opinion. I mean, she's a civilian uh, and she's asking my opinion about high level military policy. Um, so it was a, you know, not only am I her military assistant, but she very much values my opinion and thoughts about things that are happening at a strategic level. So I would say a turning point in my career in terms of, you know, now not just the young A-10 tactical pilot who, you know, was probably the best I would have ever been in the airplane kind of at that captain level. Um, and I wasn't really sure if I was ever going to get to go back uh, to the A-10. And uh, thankfully, got an opportunity to go be a group commander, uh, promoted to colonel, wow. and went on to be a group commander. And uh, back at Davis Monthan Air Force Base, they're short on instructor pilots, and uh, got to fly again uh, back in the A-10. So, and that's, that's where I finished out my flying career, um, spending time as a group commander. So now I've got roughly a thousand airmen spread out around South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. Uh, responsible for counter drug operations, uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, totally different than flying the A-10, yeah. uh, but leading people and being in charge of people. And I, I, you know, if my passion and purpose was supporting troops on the ground, well, I found a new purpose in terms of being a commander and leading people. I just, I loved it. I really loved connecting with my airmen and um, learning about their missions. So that was an incredible opportunity. And pretty damn cool to be able to fly the A-10 as a colonel uh, and still get back in the airplane. Yeah. You know, the A-10 is interesting because, you know, as as ground troops, like we love we love Spectre. Right. And we love A-10s and and we love helicopters. And the A-10 is really the most personal uh, airplane, you know, helicopter like a helicopter in, in the sense of, you know, Spectre is hitting their targets from from a good range. The A-10 has the most personality for the yeah, ground It really troops, does. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, that unique. And, you know, like, I feel, I don't know. It's one of those things where, like, when you remember the A-10s, like, hitting the mountains when, you know, the, the hills above you, when, you know, fire's coming down on you, you're like, oh, yeah, you guys are fucked. You guys are screwed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think one of the things that I love about flying the airplane is just, I think there is a special bond that exists between A-10 pilots and, and, and ground troops. Yeah. And I saw it more than ever in, in Afghanistan because we lived at Bagram and yeah. so did the ground troops. Yeah. And um, even the teams that were out at the different forward operating bases would often come through Bagram, you know, and there's something, you know, to be said about, meeting the team that you supported, like after the fact, like just, it was really, it, it just, it kind of reaffirms everything that you do, you know, all the risks you take, the time away from home, all of those things when you see the guys that you support and you're like, yeah, I, I know we made a difference. And I just think there's a connection. Like we really, like close air support is our bread and butter. It's what we do. We try to learn you know, I don't pretend to know it as well, but I try to really understand like how our ground troops work, how they operate. We understand the terminology. If the A-10 goes, ever goes away, which I know it will at some point, that passion, that drive, that purpose has to exist in whatever airplane it is out there. And I think that's kind of the mission for A-10 pilots is, you know, how do we continue that? Because that is, that lends credibility to what we do. It it drives purpose for what we do and it makes a difference, you know, a pilot that truly understands what's going on. Um, but that was probably for me when I look back, like that bond, that relationship, you know, people have reached out to me on social media that like we connect about, they were the guys on the ground that I supported, you know, meeting people after the fact has just been rewarding. And, you know, to meet a, one of the, a, a young girl sent me a note and she said, you know, you saved my dad's life. I would not be alive today if it wasn't yeah. for you. Yeah. Like, that's what matters, right? Yeah. 
it's just it's awesome i love the airplane i'm passionate about it yeah and you know and especially with the a10 well i don't say especially because probably other other air platforms also but you guys are often called in when there's no ray of hope when yeah. when things are at their worst and you know people are thinking of like this is it and then boy you hear that burp. you're like oh pull you up, guys pull up yeah <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah i was wondering if you had ever had the opportunity to meet people who you had supported yeah um it's you know actually a couple of guys came through um uh, at Bagram that I met um, in, in Iraq. I didn't, unfortunately, I wasn't at the building. I'm not sure where I was at the time, but they came back and they left me a note and I have it to this day. Like it says, you saved our ass over Baghdad. Um, and I have that scribbled note on a piece of paper. I mean, um, it's been pretty awesome. Like it's just, it's, it's definitely been my passion and my purpose of supporting ground troops. And I'll tell you, it's hard when you retire and you you move on to something else, you know, how do you continue that passion and purpose? And for me, that's been while I, why I joined the board for the Special Operators Transition Foundation, because yeah, it's a different, I'm supporting ground troops, but I, I still am. It's just in a different way. You know, it's a way to give back and bring recognition to the work that our special operators have done and how, you know, how much they've given to our country and an opportunity to help them kind of move on to that next life and, you know, what comes next for them and, and give them and their family, um, you know, different perspective, different views on the things that they can do and how they can contribute to our country just in a different way. So right. that is the SOTF.org, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll, we will what, post... is, what does the foundation do exactly? Yeah, please give us some. Yeah. So we, um, this, Special operators, when they're looking to transition, so not necessarily retire, we have retired, you know, people that are retiring, people that are transitioning, um, we help them transition out of the military into their next career fields. We help them bring them into corporate America. It's, a, you know, we have um, people on our team that um, do coaching for them to figure out what they want to do, you know, where their specialties, so they're not just putting, you know, their, uh, their, what they've done in a system that spits right. something out, they're actually talking to them and leveraging their capabilities. And I find in talking to a lot of our operators, they so underplay everything that they've done um, and they've done amazing things. And so helping them understand where that brings value in corporate America, um, helping them, you know, we make connections with them. We host events where they connect in different locations where they want to be, find different, um, where they can listen to different um companies talk about what they do, really just helping them transition and helping them find kind of what comes next. Um, it's not a one and done. We stay with them until they find what they want. And then if they change their mind, we're still there and available. Um, it's a pretty awesome team and it, it's been a lot of fun. I've only been with them a, a year on the board, um, but I love what we're doing. In addition to convincing them that, you know, they're better than a security guard or a bodyguard or whatever that they're, that they can do a lot. Yeah. Is there also a lot of, I don't want to say salesmanship, but, but are you able to talk to companies and tell them that these aren't just like guys who just carry guns or guys and gals who just carry guns and that's it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's the other big piece of what we do is connecting with different companies and organizations out there to, demonstrate what our operators do. And we host events where the operators kind of talk through what they've done, give an opportunity to mingle with people. And, you know, you know what, their performance speaks for itself, right? These are guys coming in that are taking high level positions in companies. And there are things that we do in the military that, you know, sometimes we take for granted, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, how to lead a team and, or be part of a team, how to build a team, keep a team together, make time critical decisions in under stress. I mean, those are things that are valued out there. And so helping not just the individual see that, but also the companies as well. So we're, we're working both sides of that. It's such a difficult bridge to cross sometimes. And I'm really glad that there's, you know, folks like you guys out there doing that. It's, I mean, even to this day, I, I encounter people who want to hire me to be like the guy that carries a rucksack. Right. 
And it's like, you know, I, I bring a little bit more to the table right. than just that. And I'm sure every other guy who comes out of the military, in, including the special operations world, has to contend with that when they're trying to get a job. Like, yeah. hey, man, I'm, I'm a bit more than just the guy that sucks it up, you know, and drives on. I can do a little more than that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what, really what we're trying to share. You know, we kind of skipped over it in a way. I mean, we've talked about some of your deployments, but I, but you flew over 100 combat missions, right? So, yeah. like, you spent a lot of time in the hot seat. Yeah, I spent, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, all Afghanistan and Iraq. And, um, you know, I, I think when I was a cadet at the Air Force Academy, right, like, this is pre 9-11. I had no idea where my career would take me. And 9-11 changed the world for all of us I mean, right. in, in many, many ways. And I think there's no place that I would have rather been than in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and doing the job that we do. Um, and I, we did it nonstop, uh, you know, for my first assignment, you know, I ended up staying at the 75th fighter squadron longer so that I could deploy again. Um, because they needed me. Um, as, as By then, I was an experienced instructor, and they needed me to go, and I stayed. I mean, there was no doubt in my mind. Um, did it impact my life? It, yeah. I mean, I, my husband and I waited 10 years before we had kids because we spent so much time deployed and apart from each other. Um, but for me, there's there's no place I would have rather been. Um, you know, I'd, even even just NASA? Was rewarding. Even, What's that? Even NASA? If someone asked me to be an astronaut right now, I would say yes, uh, absolutely in a heartbeat. But yeah, I guess we had to come back to that, right? Like uh, there was this point in my life where I had to make a decision. Did I wanna go the NASA track to test pilot school? Um, at the time I was at the test squadron at the 422 test and evaluation squadron. And I, I love the A-10. I absolutely love the A-10. I didn't wanna give it up and I knew I would have to. And uh, not to mention like my husband and I had been apart for a long time and this was, we were finally together and uh, it was just going to be a turning point for our family and um, for giving up the A-10 and I just didn't want to. So I would still love to go to space. So if anybody's listening that has the money, that would be fantastic. Well, when uh, we get, when we get Elon Musk on the show for whatever, <laughs> for a bonus segment or whatever, yeah. we, we will. Please. Yeah, please let him go know. up with I'd Bezos be happy. and I'd Shatner. Say yes. yeah, yeah, we will absolutely get you on SpaceX or or yeah. whatever we can do. So I'd say yes in a heartbeat. But you know, no, I'm. You know, sometimes you have these goals in life, right? And um, and then your priorities change. Sure. Um, and they change for different reasons. And I think sometimes we're hard on ourselves because we're like, ah, oh, I made that goal, I didn't achieve it. Um, but I, my life took a different path. Well, and, and the goals. Totally I mean, content. the things that you did achieve. Like nobody sits in when they're five years old or even in high school goes, I'd like, I want to earn a distinguished flying cross for, you know, landing an A-10 in manual mode, which very few pilots have ever done. Right. Yeah. yeah I mean, you flew a hundred combat missions deployed all over the place and had, and had a couple of kids in between all of that. And saved I mean, a lot of lives. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that Jack and I being like ground guys know how many lives you and and your fellow pilots in those A-10s have saved. Yeah. So you are the literal cavalry riding in to save the day. You know. And you have yeah. a uh, a book coming out in yeah. March. Can you tell us about that? I do. Yeah, I uh it's it's really exciting, right? Because I have worked on this for a while. I spent my last three years um, on active duty at the Air Force Academy as an instructor. And then I um, spent a year as the director for the Center for Character and Leadership Development. I was very passionate about sh the importance of sharing stories and lessons learned for all the hard things that we have done because we've learned so much along the way. And I think it's so important to share those stories. And... <laughs> I'm sitting in my office one day and uh, one of our other instructors who is actually uh, prior army came in and he's like, you know, Casey, you talk an awful lot about sharing your stories. You should write a book. And uh, I kind of laughed it off at first. And, and then he said, no, I'm serious. You should write a book and I'm going to hold you accountable. You're going to write the book. So he got me going and uh, it's been a, you know, it's been a long, 
work in progress for sure. Um, so it's exciting. It's also slightly terrifying, right? Because like, you know, you're putting it all out there. I mean, these are my stories and I'm trying to share with people, not just all the good stuff, but like the mistakes, uh, the times that I've failed, but most importantly, the lessons that came out of those things. Um, and so the book itself is, uh, it's titled Flying in the Face of Fear. And it's a fighter pilot's lessons on leading with courage. Um, and it's 12 lessons, 12 chapters about uh, different leadership principles about leading with courage. And uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm passionate about it because I believe in it. And I think it's important to share the stories, even, even when you put it out there and they, it kind of exposes like mistakes or weaknesses or things. I mm -hmm. think those are the times where I learn the most. Right. You know, right. Those hard times are really for me where I learn the most. So those are, I'm those excited are, to be able to share. Those are really it. important like stories to share too, because it gives people something to learn from the book and take away something yeah. from it that, you know, you know, when I, I had the opportunity to write a book and it's like to write that kind of stuff, it's like, maybe if I put this in here, it'll help some kid out and they won't do the same stupid stuff I did. Right. Well, that's it. Right. Like, I don't want anybody else to have to go fly yeah. over Baghdad and get hit with a missile. I mean, that like that was not uh, fun, <laughs> but I learned so much from that scenario, from that mission, from my team. I mean, there's so many lessons that I pulled from it and I just feel like it's important to share. I mean, I want people to, you know, the book title itself is flying in the face of fear. And I, I thought long and hard about using the word fear in the title, because I think sometimes we equate it to like weakness or, you know, just vulnerability. But to me, it's like, I, I don't know if you, like, how can you say that you've not experienced fear in your life, right? right? We've all faced fear. It's not like this. It doesn't have to be life or death situations. It doesn't have to be things that happen in combat. These are just fears that we all face. And so kind of sharing those techniques that I had, why I think that I was able to handle fear in a really critical moment, you know, it's, it's all these fears that we face now of like fear of failure, change, unknown, not meeting expectations. That, I mean, the list is endless, right? So I thought it was important to talk about, it's not the fear that matters, right? It's all about what you do in that moment. And that's that's really what the book is about, is about overcoming hard things and giving some people giving people some ideas of how they can do it too. So this book, Flying in the Face of Fear, is available for pre-order right now on Amazon. So it is. you should definitely buy it, everybody. <laughs> pre-order it. You. Um it's uh yeah your your story is incredible and and i mean honestly we can't wait to read more of them um there's a lot of stories about flying the a10 in there um for sure you know a lot of different missions and things where i, I pulled some lessons and then also a lot of stories about me uh leading my team as a, a commander and the lessons that i learned from my airmen uh you know not you know these are lessons that my airmen taught me um, yeah. Some of my youngest airmen, right, taught me some lessons. So those are in there too. So your uh, the the senior who was with you on that flight, your your yeah. wingman. Um, I mean, are you guys still in touch? I, I mean, is that? I yeah, imagine that are. that was a significant moment for both of you. It really was. I mean, and uh, you know, I i attribute getting home safely to the the wingmanship that he provided right that mutual support um was absolutely critical i mean i i uh i go back and i listen to the audio frequently i um i actually share it in my the presentations that i give the keynote speeches because i think it's so critical to hear just the back and forth and how the things that he said in that moment how they just they he knew what i needed to hear he understood that I couldn't get through this on my own and just how his mutual support was absolutely critical. I think for people to actually hear that um, is really important to know that, you know, you don't get through it alone. You have a team to support you. You got to put in the work so that you're ready when, the, when those right. hard times come, but you don't have to do it alone. Kim, uh, we didn't know this recording existed and this might be putting you on the spot. Is there, do you have a segment of that recording you could play for us? For our audience, uh, I maybe will it come I don't through? Know. I have to find will, it. Will it come through if she plays it? Maybe. Uh, no, she would have to share it on Zoom. Yeah, it's a that's, that's a, a yeah that might be a bit much right now. 
Um, I, but I, the the A10 is not a technical platform, right? Like technology on the A10 is much lower than the other platforms. So, well, uh, <laughs> if if you wouldn't mind sharing a portion of that, we would share it on on our Patreon for people who want to listen to that because I would love to hear. You know, I would love to hear it. And yeah. I think that a lot of people in our audience would. That is incredible. So, folks, I hope you'll go check out Kim's book. Go pre-order it on Amazon. Uh, check out her website. You also do uh, speaking engagements. And um, oh. it, Look, if you don't pre-order a book, the Russians win. <laughs> the communists win. Why do you hate America? Yeah. That's the question. Why do you, why do you hate the troops so why much would you that do you're that? not going to yeah. pre-order this book? Yeah. I don't, I don't get it. And also uh, check out uh, SOTF.org. Pass it on to your friends. Um, if you're in business, check them out. They can, they can hook you up with some motivated folks. Links down the description. Links down the description. Also, check out our Patreon page. I always forget to plug it, but if you sign up, you get access to bonus episodes, and also you get uh, access to all of the episodes of the Team House ad-free, uh, so there's no ads on it for you guys, so please go check that out. The link is down in the description, and uh, we'll see you guys next Friday with Luis. He is a former French special operations soldier, uh, so one of our allies. I love having these guys on the show and hearing you know a different viewpoint. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to him. And if your organization wants to hire Kim to speak, I've been doing some research. It's Kim dash Casey dash Campbell. That's a PB Campbell.com. That's your speaking platform, correct? It is. Yeah. You can find out uh, more just about my, the speeches that I give with some videos and examples of some of the speeches I've, I've done. And, uh, you know, I love it. I, I actually have, three in the next three weeks coming up. So it'll be busy. Um, <laughs> Look, but I love getting out there to talk to teams and, and companies about the things that uh, we've done and, and ways to help them. If she doesn't double your organization productiv productivity by 100%, I'll give you $5. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'll come, you guys I'll are come, great. Check I'll come, her out. Come, I'll uh, pay you to come speak to my daughter when she starts uh, doing bad in middle school. <laughs> Provides, I would love to speak to provide, you. Provide some added motivation. You say that, I'll get you on the phone with you. Uh, uh, I will, and I, I will, and I have. So you, <laughs> you, name, you name the time and place, and I'll do it. All right. Kim, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your service. Um, you know, we, we appreciate you. Oh, and one final shout out to the NYPD guy who was shouting at me on the street as I was walking on the sidewalk with my daughter the other day. Guy shouting at me from his police van saying, Jack, Jack. I love the podcast. I watch every episode. Just want to say That's thank awesome. you. We love you, Thank man. you, NYPD, watching the show. Uh, really appreciate it. And um, Kim, thank you so much for taking some time out of your Friday evening with us. And uh, we'll you see bet. you guys you next Friday. Fun. We love you, Kim. Thanks.